can then ask questions. We have an on-site, uh, an online class space where questions can be asked and our top ten relators, folks, or myself will answer them. <coughs> Recording has started. Uh, speaker is muted. Uh, actually, it's not. That's this one over here. Okay. Because we heard Miranda uh, say hi. Cool. So whenever you're ready to begin, you want me to go ahead and pull up your... Yeah, what, sure. Your Thanks. I'm going to move this off to my side. Oh, I got to present. Present programs. Thank you, whoever said that. Yes, now they can see it. And I can you click oh, on that yeah. so that it goes full screen? Yeah, I'm afraid that what that's going to do is come over into my other screen. I can I can switch it around. Okay. okay. Cool. Oh, sorry. Is that the primary monitor? Yeah. <coughs> cool. Yeah. We're rolling. Sweet. Okay. Uh, then we can just flip to the next slide. I'm um, Jonathan Wilson. Uh, I work at Thompson Reuters. I manage this team of digital marketers that do SEO. Um, we have people that do PPC. We have people that do video optimization. Um, and we also help our clients with intake. So once they do get like leads, um, that they're able to convert. Uh, we're just focused on the legal vertical. Uh, there's about 14,000 websites that we have in the U.S., in the U.K., and in Canada uh, that we're responsible for. So a lot of websites, a lot of traffic, um, and a really big organization as a result. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, prior to that, I was managing the team at dealer.com. Uh, this was just a pure play SEO team, uh, but kind of the same idea. They had about 8,000 websites focused in the U.S. and also Canada. Um, and they were focused on the automotive vertical. So a lot of car dealerships like Walzer, um, pretty big in Minneapolis, um, throughout the United States, we have all those websites as well. So next slide, please. Uh, so what we're going to cover today, uh, we're going to talk through why video matters, and why it's important. Uh, a little data there. Um, how it became important, and kind of the uh, intersection of technology uh, with the availability of video. Uh, then talk through gatekeepers, uh, the people who actually decide what types of videos get shown get the eyeballs, and then we'll go more granular and tactical into some considerations uh, for making online videos, and then talk through different channels and some of the best practices on those different channels. Um, when I say channels, I just mean you know, like Instagram, Facebook, uh, those are all kind of different marketing channels. Next slide, please. Uh, so why does TV matter? Next slide, please. Uh, so first, reading is in decline. It's probably not too much of a surprise to anyone but people don't read um, like they used to. Uh, so this is the amount of books that people read per year. Uh, and we can see that generally there's a decrease on the high end. We're seeing you know, the super readers reading more, but kind of casual readers, we're seeing decreases across the board. Um, people just aren't spending as much time interacting with books uh, versus you know, 10, 20 years ago. Next slide, please. Um, and then the inverse is happening in video. So as people are kind of reading books less, they're ingesting information in a different way. Um, they're doing that through consuming videos, uh, through consuming graphics, other ways that you can get a ton of information across uh, really, really efficiently. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and there's also really good engagement metrics. We've seen as people really engage with video, um, regardless of what vertical you're working in, um, whether it's you know how-to video or you're learning about you know vacation that you want to go on, uh, doing research. Um, you know, video can fulfill all those different needs really, really well. And so we see really good user engagement uh, metrics there as well. So next slide, please. Uh, it's also really powerful. Um, so this uh, is some research done by Dr. James Quigley. Um, found that a minute of video is worth about 1.8 million words. And so it's pretty powerful, the amount of content that you can get by with like a two or three second video clip versus, you know, super long article. That would be too long. Most of us probably wouldn't read. Uh, next slide, please. Um, it's also making people a ton of money. Uh, so this was from this most recent quarter. Uh, Facebook stock went up. They're making tons of money. And a lot of that is driven by engagement metrics on video. Uh, for you guys that are using Facebook, you probably see more videos in your newsfeed versus two or three years ago. Um, and fewer posts that are like those long, you know, 
text-based diatribes, right? And so it's really cranky about something, they write the two paragraphs. You don't really see that as much as people, you know, doing video, posting live. That tends to show up and get more engagement on your feed. So it drives a lot of money. Um, you know, in the larger industry, we're also seeing a similar trend. So this year, uh, you know, we're at 4.5 billion. Uh, that's going to almost double by 2018 uh, to over seven billion dollars um, in video. So there's a huge industry there, um, and it's really wide open because it's relatively new phenomenon. Um, so for a lot of you, there presents a lot of opportunity uh, to uh, make money uh, in the process, right? Get a little piece of that 7.1 billion dollars or whatever it is when you guys do graduate. Next slide, please. So some takeaways about just why it's important. Um, you know, people are reading less. People are engaging with videos more. Uh, videos making uh, a ton of money for a lot of organizations, and it's a really wide open opportunity for all of you. So next slide, please. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the history of online video, just to kind of understand uh, how it works together with new technology. So next slide. So this is way back in the day. Uh, I might be dating myself, 1995. So People used to read magazines. Uh, next slide. They used to read uh, newspapers, right, to get their news. Like how often are you now getting news from a newspaper? Like has anyone read a newspaper in the last week? We got three, three, four. Not too bad. The, <laughs> the high school group. <laughs> yeah, right? But you know, just looking at this class, right, that's, that's less than half of the people here. Um, but we all know who the president is, right? How do we find that out? Through online, through other ways of getting that information across. Yeah. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so back in 1995, right, when people were still reading magazines using newspapers, um, connection speed for you know a typical household was 56k uh, modem, which is crazy, crazy slow. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever used 56k modem, but um, you know that would be dial-up, so it would connect to the phone line and start hissing uh, when it would connect to the internet. Uh, you know, we were using the game chat back then, um, and it's obviously come a long way since then. So next slide, please. So just to give some context about what you can do with a 56K modem, you know, web pages, you could load in about a minute if it was a pretty basic web page. Photos still were taking three or four minutes, right? Just download a single JPEG file, take a few minutes, right? Now that just seems ludicrous, but back in the day, that was, that was the standard. You're downloading a CD, it's taking an entire day to get 12 songs. Right? Now you can stream songs on Spotify. Um, and then movies, no one was really even downloading this stuff. I mean, over three days, HD movie would take you a month to download. So people were not really doing this. Um, next slide, please. So we fast forward a little bit. 2000, uh, modem speeds now are about 10 times faster. Next slide. Um, and we're seeing those download times starting to decrease. So web pages, photos, songs, this is now taking under 10 minutes. So now people are able to get that type of information. CDs and movies, still taking a pretty long time. So online video isn't really a big force to be reckoned with just because it's not accessible. So next slide, please. Um, so that same time, right, that's when we saw Napster. So that was a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, file sharing service, right? You just trade that one song because that was really what you could do with that bandwidth. Um, BitTorrent, a lot of these other websites uh, for downloading files. Um, we didn't really see, no, you're good. Um, movies, right, not really being traded on these platforms yet, and just songs, kind of basic stuff. Next slide, please. 2007, so now we're, we're stepping up. So we have our two megabit uh, cable modem. So now a little bit faster, right? Um, next slide, please. And so we're seeing that same decrease uh, occur, right? Web pages, single songs, photos, all the stuff you download pretty fast. Uh, CDs a little bit longer, movies only taking about uh, an hour and a half. So if you think about how long a typical movie is, you know, 120 minutes or so. So basically every minute that you're downloading, you're getting one minute of video. So this is a really big jump because it means that now you can watch video in real time. You can be watching the minute while it's still downloading. And so the next slide. So then we're seeing, you know, a lot of new things join uh, this digital marketing ecosystem. So 2007, YouTube, right, kind of seems like a main stay now. It's less than 10 years old. It's less than a decade old. Uh, Netflix, same thing, right? Most people have it, or at least have their friend's password uh, for it. Um, you know, same thing. Uh, now, because you're going to be watching that video while it's downloading at the exact same time. So we're seeing that the technology is really allowing us to be able to watch video in a way that we weren't able to do 15 years ago. Next slide, please. 2015, we're up to 25 megabits. Next slide. 
Uh, now we're seeing you know even larger decreases. You know, downloading entire movies in about ten minutes. Uh, next slide. Uh, and then more and more people joining us on the video front, right? Because it becomes more and more accessible, uh, we see more kind of traditional players joining it, like HBO or Apple. Uh, PlayStation moving over from being you know exclusively a video game organization to one that now does you know, pure play entertainment, whether that be video games or it be uh, you know movies that you're watching, um, apps, etc. Next slide, please. Uh, 2017. So hopefully we'll be getting uh, fiber soon. Do you guys have fiber optic here at the school for your internet? Not, not internally. No. Nope. Yeah, we don't have it at Thompson. <clears throat> We're at 100 meg. Yeah. There's some cities. I think Kansas was one of the cities that got Google uh, fiber City. optical. City. Yeah. Um, so they're uh, able to now get blazingly fast speeds. Next slide, please. Um, and so, as a result, right, all this stuff is going to be down in, in a couple minutes, right? You can get an entire video downloaded in a couple minutes. It's crazy. Uh, next slide, please. Right. Did I not go? And then, yeah. Uh, nope. But yeah, HD video is five minutes. It's so fast. Um, so what we're seeing now is because uh, you can download these videos and upload them so quickly with our connection speed, a lot of people are using live uh, video, right? So as you're, you're filming it, you're uploading it, someone else can be watching it at the exact same time. Miranda has fiber. Oh, she does? Yeah, nice. she's one of the online. Good for her. So yeah, I'm jealous. Now I want your paper due a week early. Right? So it's due <laughs> she has no excuses. It's due tonight. You <laughs> shouldn't have said that. You should have said you had a 56K. Um, but YouTube, you know, starting moving into on-demand broadcasting. We have Instagram, <coughs> Facebook Live, um, Twitch TV. So does anyone here use Twitch? A lot of a lot of people using Twitch TV. Excellent. Um, so you guys know, right? Is that you can watch people play video games, you know, um, post comments. A lot of people are, that's their livelihood. They they literally make a hundred thousand plus dollars per year to play video games, talk, and have people watch it. That's crazy, right? We weren't able to do that even three years ago, four or five years ago. Um, and now it's the new normal. Uh, next slide, please. Did it not go? Sorry. Um, and then, you know, some more uh, live near life, right? We've got Snapchat, Twitter, um, a lot of other channels where we can still be broadcasting really, really quickly. Next slide, please. Um, so let's move forward. Uh, so prediction-wise, right, we're seeing that the technology is making video more accessible. We're seeing that video is moving up. People are engaging there, um, and people are really bull, um, bullish on uh, video. So this is um, one person from Facebook. She's one of our VPs. Um, she does Europe, uh, Africa, and I think she has part of Asia. She oversees that entire region. So literally billions of people. Um, you know, and her big quote was that Facebook was going to be all video in the next five years, right? Because that's the content people engage in. As we get faster download speeds, it's going to be easier. Here to see this stuff. And so she's really, really bullish on uh, Facebook. Next slide, please. So RIP, um, you know, to the newspapers. I, I we saw three or four people uh, that do read the papers. But, you know, as this stuff gets faster and faster, Facebook is all video. You get your news all video, or you can read this kind of manual piece of paper that's like this big, right? You're going to probably watch the videos. Next slide, please. Uh, so some takeaway, basically just the, you know, uh, intersection of faster bandwidth, cheaper production <coughs> means that there's big disruption. You know, a lot of uh, difference in the way that people are consuming this media versus 10, 15 years ago, and it is just trending uh, upward as we go forward. Next slide, please. Uh, so let's move into um, you know the actual content. So now, who determines you know how we get that content? So next slide, please. So in the beginning, next slide, please. In 1995, we had serious gatekeepers. Uh, so, for instance, as a news program, right, if you think about everything that goes into broadcasting this news, it's insane, right? You're paying this person $60,000 a year. They got all these people researching things. You have to get super expensive cameras. It's, it's a big, it's a production. Literally, it is a production, right, costing hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, next slide, please. Um, and, you know, the only people that have that money are giant organizations. Um, you know, they also get to determine what types of content you can get shown to users. Next slide, please. Um, so for instance, uh, this is from a few years ago, but this is Monsanto, um, you know, forced Fox TV to censor some coverage of dangerous milk, uh, essentially 
um, they were doing a behind the scenes of cows and they were adding certain things to make them grow more, but they were also super gross, gnarly uh, things that we don't really want to be drinking. Um, Fox News can't run that, right? Montesano is running ads on them. They say, hey, I don't want to see this stuff where you're talking down to my brand. I'm giving you guys $30 million per year. They're not going to run it, right? That's kind of the problem with having gatekeepers because they determine what type of content or information you get. It's not you deciding, right? They're, they're just giving something to you. Next slide, please. Um, and it costs a lot more. So just for you know contrast, right? Michael Jackson, this is his... Like scream, scream yeah. was it scream? Yeah, um, seven million dollars uh, to make this music video. About ten million dollars in, in modern fees. Like now, that just seems insane, right? Ten million dollars to make a single music video, and he ended up only selling one million copies. So huge loss on that single music video. But that's the gatekeeper, right? It was this event, it was Michael Jackson, it would change, uh, you know, programming for various stations to debut the new video. And that's what happens when gatekeepers are kind of at the helm of what we're able to consume. Next slide, please. Um, so in 2007, we see this big smashing of the gates, right, that we said before. We've got YouTube, Netflix, what we want, mobile. Next slide. Um, and so we see big changes. So this is Soldier Boy's uh, original video from way back in the day. Uh, if you guys remember the Crank Dat song, um, you know, it cost him less than $5,000 to make that video. As a result, he sold 5 million copies. Um, so kind of contrast that with Michael Jackson spending $10 million in today's money to sell a million copies. This guy is taking $5,000, turning it into 500 or into 5 million songs, right? Just think about the return on your investment there versus that Michael Jackson video. It's a big change now because you don't need Fox News. You don't need the big production. All you need is content that resonates with your audience, and you can monetize that and make some serious cash. Also, sunglasses help. Next slide, please. Um, Donald Trump, right? Same same thing that we have here. So this is a little bit earlier. This was during the primaries, uh, March March fifteenth. So this is when he's starting to kind of spank the other people uh, that he was running with uh, in the Republican primaries. Like, look at the amount of money that people are spending. This is in millions, right? Jeb Bush, eighty two million dollars. The amount of free coverage he got, you know, pretty small, right? We go down the line. Trump's really in the, the bottom half of that. Look at all that free content he's getting. That's because the gatekeepers have changed, right? If people want to engage with that content, they're going to engage with it, right? Um, and, and it's going to be really, really cheap because you can use social channels, you can use videos, a lot of other ways to get your message across. So it's no longer, right, that old guard with the gatekeeper. They're still thinking in that 1995 mode, right? I'm just going to throw as much money as possible at this thing, and then I'm going to get all the coverage. And that's not the case, right? You don't have to throw the money. He's using an eighth of the amount of money Bush is, but he's getting nine times as much coverage, ten times as much coverage. Um, you know, on that same vein, uh, this is more recently, I think this was a week or two ago, um, you know, before the actual election, he just posted um, a video of him addressing Selma in North Carolina, you know, a big rally. He got seven million people to watch that video, right? All he had to do was post something on, on Facebook. Again, pretty low production costs. Um, but huge impact, right? Touching 7 million different viewers to watch that live broadcast. So we're seeing with the gatekeepers leaving a uh, new opportunity to really get your message across. Whether or not you know you agree with the politics or you know whether or not you like Soldier Boy or whatever is irrelevant. I think the, the more uh, important takeaway is that there's tremendous opportunity if you're giving the audience what they want to do it on the cheap versus you know spending $82 million. Uh, don't make it that far in the Republican primaries. Next slide. Um, so yeah, now post gatekeepers, we have the audience deciding content. Does anyone know who this guy is? Yeah. No, he doesn't. It's an older, older uh, screenshot. Um, essentially, uh, this is a guy who um, you know kind of has irreverent content. Uh, a lot of it centers around kind of like video game youth culture stuff. Uh, if we go to the next slide. Um, and he does crazy numbers, right? 48 million subscribers, he comes out with 12 episodes a week, uh, so a couple uh, per day. Three million views on average per episode. Uh, 300 million monthly views, right, <coughs> per month. Um, and so if we kind of do the math, um, generally, like a CPM, which is a cost per thousand, um, you're gonna get between a dollar, 
maybe a little bit lower depending on what uh, content type you have, maybe a little bit higher depending on what type of audience you have. So even if we just assume a dollar, which is a pretty conservative CPM, he's making $300,000 a month. That's crazy money, right? $3.6 million in a year. Uh, insane. Uh, if we go to the next slide, please. Um, and even just to look at the stats, kind of contextualize it. So this is the Super Bowl. This is like the biggest event in kind of traditional media. Uh, this past year, 16, we're slightly above 110. You know, before that, maybe like 112, but you know, not not super high. So he's doing three times that in a month, right? He's got three Super Bowls happening uh, every single month. Crazy numbers. Next slide. Uh, same thing, uh, Ryan's toy reviews. So um, this is kind of interesting with the gatekeeper part because they'll give critical reviews sometimes if the toys are not cool. So again, we think about you know Monsanto type company or Mattel, right? If Fox wanted to run a story about how this toy sucks, right? Mattel's <coughs> going to say, no, you can't run that, or else I'm going to pull all the money that we're spending with you guys. In contrast, right? Because those gatekeepers are gone that he can just create uh, this content with them reviewing different toys. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and again, we see you know giant numbers there, right? 61 million views, 50 million views, 527 million views. This is just like a guy with his kid reviewing toys, like pretty basic stuff. Um, but you know, it resonates with the audience, uh, has big, bold colors. You know, it's engaging content, so it's going to work pretty well. Next slide. Um, and so, you know, just to run, his numbers are even more uh, significant. Uh, he's got 4.5 million subscribers. I looked at it a couple of weeks later, and it was up to 4.7. So he got 200,000 uh, additional subscribers, you know, from the beginning to the end of the month. Uh, eight episodes a week, and he's getting about half a billion views uh, per month, which is crazy. And so, again, right, half a million dollars in ad revenue per month. Six million dollars per year. He's just reviewing toys with his kids. Um, so again, right, tremendous opportunity with video. That's where the eyeballs are at. If you can monetize this stuff, run ads on your YouTube videos, and make some serious dough. Next slide. Um, and so there's some changes, right? Now that we're post-gatekeeper, people are looking for less kind of like polished personalities, more kind of like real authentic people, um, you know, that really understand their audience, engage with their audience. Um, and these are kind of, you know, our new, our new celebrities um, that we have. So this is a pretty good example of, you know, a setup, right? It's just a microphone, someone sitting on their couch uh, recording something, and that's how they make videos. And so kind of contrast that at the beginning when we were looking at the gatekeepers, and so to have a news, um, uh, presentation, right? You got to buy the videos. You got to spend hundred thousand dollars for all this giant staff. Now it's like, you know, you buy a microphone, hundred, two hundred bucks. You have your laptop, six hundred bucks, and a webcam. And you're good. Crazy. Next slide. So some main takeaways from uh, the transition from the pre and post uh, gatekeeper era, um, you know, is that the role of the gatekeeper is shrinking. They're still there, right? We still have a traditional media. It's still good to kind of understand how it works, but they're definitely being unseated uh, for people who are more savvy with alternate ways to do marketing. Next slide, please. Um, so let's talk about some variables. Um, get a little bit more kind of tactical and out of the, out of the clouds uh, next <coughs> slide. So some key uh, variables to consider um, really um, is, is important of how it relates to whatever media um, so this is old school guy, medium is the message. Uh, he was making films at the time. And so, you know, film, right, needs to be different than television. For instance, it's a different medium, different length. Next slide, please. Um, so in these, we can go pretty quick. But um, this is kind of traditional format, right? 21 minutes, 9 minutes for commercials, and it's a 30-minute you know, time slot. That's what we see on TV. Next slide. Um, same thing, right? You just multiply it by 2 for hour long. Actually, The Office is only 21 minutes. Next slide. Um, you know, Walking Dead, same thing, right, 42 minutes, next slide, nope, you're good, um, you know, 60 minutes, right, it's actually only 42 minutes, um, but, you know, the format is almost identical when you're watching television, right, There's, it's either going to be 30 minute or hour long slots, basically, next slide, and so if you contrast that, right, with Facebook um, or YouTube or any other videos that you have in terms of length, you're going to find all across the board, right, because the length should really just reflect what type of content you have, it could be something, you know, 30 second clip, um, or it could be something that's a you know 45 minute tutorial, um, and everything in between and, and longer. Next slide. 
Um, and so let's talk through some variables. So context is really important. So when you're thinking about creating video, you want to think about how the person is actually going to be consuming this video. So if it's something um, you know on the go, you probably want to make that video a little bit shorter. If it's something where it's uh, you know more closely aligned with maybe what we think of as like a feature, uh, maybe you're going to have a little bit higher production value, and the length is going to be a little bit longer. So whenever you're creating videos, you want to think about your audience and the way that they're going to be consuming this. Make sure that you make the video appropriately. Um, for instance, if she, you know, had the opportunity to look at a video and she's on the go, right? She's on her bike. And if it's an hour long, she's just going to pick a different video. And so you really want to be thoughtful about your audience as you're creating content. Next slide. Um, frame size matters too. And so think about, you know, what phone, um, or if they're using desktop or whatever platform, and making sure that that video is optimized in the appropriate way. Um, a lot of times getting larger uh, frame size is more useful just because it takes up more of someone's phone. Most people are consuming um, this media on their cell phones. And so to be thoughtful about that is really important as well. Next slide. Um, I went through devices. Next slide. Um, and also, you know, be thoughtful about how these views get initiated. So does someone actually have to uh, think about you know pressing the play button. Is it going to autoplay like a lot of the videos that are in your Facebook feed? Um, you know, is there, is there a rollover? Are there different ways that people can look at it? And depending on how people initiate it, you want to optimize differently as well. Next slide. Uh, audio on or off. So this is a screenshot from Facebook. So a lot of people when they're consuming videos on Facebook, you know, they might be like in class or they might be somewhere where you can't you know have the sound on. Um, and so adding text to it so that even people who can't hear, like still understand what the content's about, becomes really, really helpful. Um, so always be thoughtful about how people are consuming it. Um, you know, don't assume that everyone's going to have it, you know, sound on and be listening intently. You know, maybe they're just going to be looking at the video on the go while they're doing something else. Next slide. Um, and then length we went through. Next slide. Um, one great way um, to understand how the length of your video is doing is to just use data. So this is from YouTube. Uh, you can look at watch time. And so for different videos, you can understand how much of the video are people watching? Um, are they dropping off? Are they engaging with their content? So these two videos, these are both really short videos. So they're only watching for 22, 23 seconds. But that's OK, because you know, 98, 99% of the people are completing that entire video. So if you can get your message across in 25 seconds, it's really good, right? This video, in contrast, is about three minutes long. And so most people are only watching two seconds of it, and then they're jumping out. So these metrics can be really helpful to understand, am I making this video too long? Am I making it too short? Does it take too long to get to the point? Like, do I have a long intro and some like crazy motion graphic that lasts 15 seconds where people are just going to leave? Or am I getting right to the point, giving the people that value up front um, so that they can engage with it? So yeah, 8.4%. Uh, percentage viewed, not that good. There's lots of opportunity here, whereas these two probably doing pretty good. Next slide. Um, another thing to think about is story arc. So this is kind of a traditional movie story arc, uh, whether you're watching Disney or um, whatever else, um, you know, a new Jason Bourne movie, it's going to be the same thing, right? Some conflict uh, challenge, you know, maybe they're going to be on top of an F-14 jet doing something, and then, you know, that resolution at the end, right? That quick, witty one-liner. So that model is going to work for, you know, something that's two hours long plus, but if you're optimizing for a 30-second video, you have to kind of rethink that story arc. How can you get the point across quicker without kind of following that traditional um, you know, story path that we're so used to? Next slide, please. Uh, so let's talk specifically about those different channels. So we talked about those variables, so let's put those variables into practice. So next slide. Uh, so YouTube. So YouTube is really good um, because there's a lot of options in terms of length. Um, so for vlogging, um, which is what this dude's doing, uh, how-to video, how DIY video, showing people how to achieve something, those do really well. You know, obviously pranks, comedy, I think those kind of overlap. Um, you know, you can get master cuts. You can just put in some down and then fail, and then you can like it, you know, five minute video of like car fails or like dance fails or whatever it is. Um, and that content really engages and does really well. TV skits, so again, that longer format works. Um, so here, you know, people normally have sound on if they're watching YouTube videos because they're going there exclusively to watch videos. So they're probably going to have headphones versus some of the other channels, which we'll get into later. So next slide. 
Um, so some platform insights, and I won't read through all of these because um, I can give you this the deck after. Okay. Can I give you the, the yeah. deck afterwards? Cool. Yeah. Um, Okay, but some kind of key key things here. Um, watch time is really key. Uh, viewer velocity is really important too. And so if you're wondering like why certain videos get featured, it's because they have video velocity. That means a lot of people are watching that video really, really, really quickly. And so they have algorithms to understand, okay, tons of people are engaging with this video that just dropped. Let me show it to more and more users. Um, if people aren't watching your videos or if it's just you, know, you and three or four friends, you're probably not gonna get featured. You're probably not gonna see that explosive growth. So making sure that when you do get a, a new video, uh, to use different marketing ways to make sure a lot of people engage with it really quickly can really help that video uh, get more lift and more visibility for different folks. Um, again, you know, view duration is uh, super important, um, and people enjoy using different channels. So people, you know, subscribing to different users that's going to help you know, get your video shown to more people and get more engagement. Next slide. Um, so the YouTube video algorithm, um, so no one really knows, and so that, that's the caveat, is I'm going to add that this is uh, an informed guess based on data from video marketing company. Um, they don't have YouTube's algorithm. Um, I've been to a lot of conferences and talked to YouTube folks. No one really knows the algorithm because they have different people responsible for different parts of it. Um, so there's probably a really small amount of people that know the true secret sauce. So this is speculation, but you know, based on their data, it's pretty pretty close. Um, one thing people are going to look at is links. So how many people are linking to your video, right? Best video ever. You're seeing a lot of traffic coming from different sources. That's going to help that video, you know, get a lot of traffic, a lot of engagement, get that velocity that I was talking through as well. But also reinforce a lot of people getting value, right? If you if you add this link to your blog. That means that you know it's really important. Just like um, when you guys were talking through offsite SEO, same idea, right? Links are valuable because they, they send trust signals. This is good content. This is engaging content. Other things, the title. So making sure you have a descriptive title, um, not making the word count too long, but a synced uh, and accurate title is going to be helpful. Uh, different keywords. So um, you know, using slang probably not the best thing on YouTube. Um, the algorithm isn't going to know everything unless you are focused on a very small group that does use you know that specific type of language. But generally, using you know, broad terms that everyone gets is going to be more helpful. Um, user behavior, um, so how are people interacting, are they commenting, are they liking, um, how long are they staying on your um, video, um, how are they sharing it, um, looking at the resolution, video length, all those different factors that we were talking through, that's what all goes into the algorithm. But it's good to know if you just focus on you know, getting shares, right? people engaging with that content, putting it on their website, and having a good description, that's about 75% of your optimization is done just there. So if you just focus on those big pieces, you're already going to be well ahead of most other people in your community. Next slide. <clears throat> um, just more breakdown of that algorithm. Watch time, super, super important. Um, that's how they know this is good, right? If you watch the whole video, good video. If you're jumping after two seconds, probably not the best video. Next slide. Um, I'll just skip that. That's kind of redundant. Next slide. Um, so let's move over to <coughs> Facebook. Uh, so Facebook, that's a little bit more where the text on screen is going to be important. So as people are flipping through their Facebook feed, right, they're not listening to headphones necessarily. And so having that text on screen is going to help your video get more engagement and for more people um, to see that video. Uh, most of their users are on mobile, so you want to make sure that you're optimizing for a mobile platform that's you know uh, vertical as opposed to you know, horizontal, which you'll find on YouTube. Um, you know, lots of autoplays going on, so again, get to the point quick, so you can kind of grab that person early on. And their short content is really important, right? We're kind of reading this stuff in little bite-sized morsels versus YouTube, you know, you're sitting down and watch YouTube for a little while. Next slide. Um, some insights, I won't go too much into the Facebook algorithm because it's probably redundant with the social class, um, but essentially, you know, you post your video, whatever, um, Facebook's going to have an algorithm based on you know who your friends are, who normally engages with your videos. It's going to determine what types of posts you have actually get shown to different users. Um, and so even though you have this big audience of fans, you know they're only going to get little pieces. Um, that's for us. For businesses, it's even tougher. Uh, this filter is um, even harder to get through. So it's really important to use sponsored posts if you have that available. 
Um, it tends to be pretty cheap, but generally Facebook wants you to spend some money if you're a business to get your video shown out to people. Next slide. Um, and so this is the same idea, just in a, in a different format, but basically the interest slash engagement plus the number of posts, who's making it, what type of video is it, how recent was it made, that's how they understand what videos need to be shown in different ways. So that's kind of the, the big pieces that go into that Facebook algorithm that filters who of your friends are going to see uh, those videos. Next slide. Um, so I forget what this is. Next slide. Uh, okay, yeah, and then a little, um, there's a change in the way that the Facebook algorithm has been working. So, uh, and again, this is only two years ago, uh, used to have clickbait, um, you know, really, really prevalent, still there, but the filters are getting better at cutting through it. So you guys have all seen those videos that are like, you won't believe what happens next, and you click through it, and then it's just like pop-up ads forever. Um, They've been working to you know, decrease those, um, and it's getting more and more sophisticated. And now they're using real user behavior metrics to understand what type of content is good. Um, obviously, there's been some criticism post-election on uh, Facebook and kind of the way the algorithm works and shows different content to different people. And so moving forward, we're going to see more and more refinement of this algorithm and how it gets shown to different people, um, which should be good, but, but we'll see. Next slide. Uh, same thing here uh, with Facebook, uh, some best practices. If you're making a video, even just adding a top and a bottom is going to take up so much more of that screen space. So it's a really small optimization strategy, but instead of running it like a typical kind of YouTube, add the top and bottom, now you've taken over that whole, whole, whole thing. Whereas before, you're like, oh, what's Steve into, right? Then you're going to flick up, you're going to miss that video. And so it's a best practice, again, to make it bigger for that format with most of the people on mobile. Next slide. Uh, so Snapchat, um, how many people use Snapchat? Everyone? More than newspapers, which is good. Um, so I won't, I won't go too much into the details. You guys already know how it works, right? It disappears after 24 hours. Next slide. Um, vertical video, right? Instead of any type of horizontal format, and then it takes up you know, your whole phone as well. Um, so Narrative has been doing some studies on uh, Snapchat and how engagement works there. So followers is not a metric that they take into account, um, which is different than Facebook or YouTube, right? If you have lots of subscribers, you're going to see a lot. Um, having tons of uh, Snapchat followers isn't as useful. Um, in contrast, they're going to look at how many people are looking at your stuff, how many people are looking at your stuff and watching the whole thing through, and how many people are just clicking through, right? This boring content, I don't care. Um, how many people are taking screenshots? Uh, right, because you get that alert that says someone took a screenshot, so it's kind of creepy. So people are liking your content so much that they're constantly screenshotting it. That's sending signals that you have awesome content, right? People really, really like that stuff. And then completion rate, same thing, right? Watching the whole story. Next slide. Um, DJ Khaled, obviously doing really well on Snapchat. Um, you know, also they look at other data, um, you know, about about how you compare with other people kind of in the same segment. So if you use this tool, Narrative, uh, you can get different engagement metrics um, and get a better understanding about how various posts are doing. Um, and it's really helpful on a business application. So you can scale as, make it a CSV file, make some pretty charts for your clients. Next slide. Um, you know, screenshots again, right, showing that people are really, really engaged. You can say you have really good, relevant content. These are good things. Next slide. Uh, completion rate went through that. Next slide. Um, Instagram videos. So there it's really about having really, really beautiful content, right? Where YouTube, it's more kind of authentic. Um, and then Snapchat, it's, uh, it's a little bit more raw, kind of behind the scenes, a little bit less refined. Um, Instagram, um, you know, the, the videos, because of all the filters, it's really about having something that's visually engaging um, there. Um, lots of people are, you know, cross-promoting their Snapchat channels um, or their Facebook channels on Instagram as well because they might have a lot of engaged users there, and that's a way you can kind of pr cross-promote to get more and more people engaged across all these different channels. Um, you can also integrate this with just traditional SEO as well. So if you got a great website, new page, new product, whatever, um, you know, insert that link there, and then uh, more people can jump over. So we see that like with the Kardashians, uh, they, I think it was a new lipstick, I forget which Kardashian it was, oh, but, well, Kylie Cosmetics. which one? Kylie. Thank you. Uh, Kylie Cosmetics. 
um, right? But she's posting it and then within minutes um, selling out, literally getting millions of people to jump over to the traditional website and then sell that product. And so it's really good for cross promotion. Again, format, uh, that's going to be square video. So with YouTube, you're going to go horizontal, you know, full screen for Snapchat, uh, larger box for Facebook, and then square here. And so you can kind of think when you're creating videos, hey, if I want to put this on all these different channels, I need to optimize and export this video in a bunch of different ways so that it works really well for the audience. Next slide. Uh, Twitter. Um, so Twitter has videos. Uh, they did have a live at Periscope, which they put to bed uh, in the last couple of months. Um, video works OK uh, with Twitter. I think it works better for um, people who have giant followings. I wouldn't try to start um, you know, my, my video presence on Twitter. But again, it's a good way to kind of cross promote to your traditional video channels. Next slide. Um, hashtags are really good uh, to use on Twitter versus other sites. You know, they might not show up at all. Um, videos get a lot more retweets than GIFs. I think less people are putting videos on Twitter, so it's a good way to distinguish yourself versus the competition, right? It's just a lot of text and then some photos. And so if you're doing videos, you're going to be ahead um, of a lot of people. And again, um, you want to keep those videos really short, right? Because at Twitter, we're just consuming this little bite-sized pieces. So you want to make sure the videos follow that same format as well. Next slide. So some takeaways from those different channels that we just talked through is to really be thinking about you know, the actual channel. Think about how you use it, how you engage with it. Talk to a few other people, maybe watch some other people. You know, use Facebook to make sure um, you, know, you don't consume it in a way that's totally unique. But from understanding these different channels and kind of the, the history and, and the movement where video is going, we can get a lot closer uh, to making sure that we're providing really good, relevant content for our users. And I think that's it. Next slide. Yeah, thank you. So if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Are there any on the phone line? Uh, nobody has posted one yet. You guys got any questions? Schroeder's Schroeder. Peter is typing something right now. So I have a kind of a weird situation. Yep. Uh, my partner organization has a YouTube link on their website. And uh, <clears throat> this website they bought from a different company before. And when I went to look at all the YouTube videos, like all of them, are denied on copyright claim. So uh, I haven't asked them about it yet, about what they want to do with it. Uh, but if they want to like keep all that video content, would it be better to try and use that same account still, or just like make a fresh account and like re-upload everything? I would try, well, I would look first at how many <coughs> subscribers they have. Not so, very much. No. It, it hasn't been active for like two years. If it's not that popular, I think you'd be fine just moving over. Mm -hmm. um, but I, yeah, I wouldn't apply that to everyone. So if you're in a similar situation, but say your brand has 3,000 plus followers, I wouldn't do that. I would just um, you know, use those same videos, understand what parts. You know, it's probably music. Are they just using copyright music? No, it's. I, I don't know why it's gone. It's a bird watching like website huh. that they bought from somebody else, and now they own it all. So I don't know why they wouldn't have the rights to it because I know that that company got bought out. Yeah, sometimes you can uh, send an email just to help to get a better understanding about why uh, it was turned down. Normally what I've seen is mainly it's um, like people will even have an intro and it'll be 10 seconds of some song and then they'll shut down the entire video. Like skateboard videos get shut down, right, because they have songs in the background, like snowboard, like GoPro type videos. Um, but for birds, I wonder if, if maybe they're using it. Like, it says it's still content. like copyrighted by the whole company. I don't yeah. know why it would be, though. Because like, they, bought, they bought them out years ago. Yeah, I would talk to the old company, too, to get a better understanding. I don't, I don't they, think it exists anymore. Is there, is there like a guy that they bought it from? Yeah, like it's bought by Reader's <laughs> Digest. I'm working with them. Uh -huh. So I, I don't know who. Uh, I, I'll have to ask them. Like, who was dealing with it. Yeah, because what it might just be like a really easy um, yeah. fix. It just needs someone to acknowledge something on a piece of paper. Um, so reaching out to them. But I would just start with their customer service 
to get a better understanding. Um, and if they don't respond to you, which is totally likely, um, just try reposting the videos, but pay attention and kind of ask some questions. Like if the content looks really good, really refined, they might have borrowed it from the original content creator. Well, like they have professionally made content. Yeah. Like, I don't know why it's just not made, but why it's still copyrighted by the whole company. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll like, ask them. I'm interested uh, in that. Because, yeah, if there's no copyrighted content, it would seem like it would be fine, but it might just be a legal issue. I got some questions online. Sure. Uh, first, there's two questions. Thoughts on Snapchat spectacles? Uh, it's a gimmick. Um, <laughs> so Snapchat's uh, spectacles, they're just glasses. They have two cameras there. I think there's a popular video of like a dog with uh, so Snapchat spectacles on. All uh, right, so talked about that. So cool. Yeah, did you watch the dog too? Oh, no. <laughs> I was, we made a video. Like that. Yeah. Oh, nice. Uh, it's okay. I mean, it's a gag. It, to get the spectacles really hard on eBay, they're about a thousand dollars. You can get them from pop-up stores for 24 hours that are 120 dollars, but you have to wait in line. And so I just think the amount of people that are even going to get, um, you know, the tool to begin with is going to be pretty limited. Like I don't think that they'll just have it. Like there probably won't be a pop-up in this town, right? It's probably going to be in like LA, New York, really large places. Um, so it's cool. If you got it, you could make videos about having it, and you'd probably get more videos talking about the spectacles than actually making a video with the spectacles. Because um, it's basically, you can do the same thing with GoPro, you know, just on your head. Um, but it's a novelty thing. And the second question is, are there major SEO benefits in YouTube Live? Uh, so no, no traditional SEO benefits. So SEO is going to be more focused on your website. Um, if you're doing any optimization on YouTube, that's going to be separate um, in a strict sense. Um, in a kind of loose sense, if you are making really good videos, if you are using YouTube Live really well, it's a great opportunity to cross-promote your traditional website. If you do that, you get a lot of traffic to your website, a lot of people engaging with your website, then it can have an indirect positive effect on a site's SEO. Um, but there's no direct link just because you're doing really well in YouTube Live um, if you're not cross-promoting it, you're not going to get any SEO benefit out of it. Here's a question. What is your opinion on uh, programs like Gift and things that actually connect certain media posts across you know, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter? Yeah, I use um, like Hootsuite. It's the same same idea. I think those are really helpful for planning. Um, so calendars are are uh, something that folks don't talk as much about, um, but they're really important. Hate to use more Kardashian uh, uh, references, uh, but they're really good at it. Um, and so right, they know where they're going to be traveling uh, over the course of the year. Right, their handlers are like, okay, you're going to go here, you're going to take photos here. Right. So in advance, they know when they're going to travel, so they can make videos or they can make posts even before they go there. Um, and then they cross-promote it to the app. And so you can buy, like if they know they're going to a beach place, then in advance they're going to build out um, you know, posts linking to certain new outfits that are on the app, and they do crazy money um, that way as well. And so those tools are really cool because then you can be at an actual spot and you've already built you know, all these posts in advance, and so you just let it run. Um, Four Hour Workweek is a really good uh, book about that same topic, but it's a great way to just scale things so that you're not constantly um, you know, posting and updating. Um, a lot of people that I know that do that, they just take Sunday and they'll post for the entire week, schedule it all out. And so it looks like you know they're constantly posting every 15 minutes, 20 minutes, but in actuality it's just a program that's just automating all that stuff. So yeah, they're awesome. What is this? Um, you work at Fine Law is your good. Yep. You talk about how this is having an effect within Thompson Reuters at Fine Law. Yeah. Um, so video continues to be a growth area, um, especially in the legal space. Um, lawyers are just old guard, so they're just probably 10 or 15 years behind you know, the rest of the industry, which is fine. Um, but we've seen crazy engagement numbers um, for our video product um, because people want to understand like who's the lawyer that I'm going to be talking to. So we do a lot of things that are um, aimed at instilling confidence in 
potential uh, clients, um, reinforcing the, the competence of the lawyer. Um, do they want to come across as really like warm? Maybe they're like a family lawyer. Do they want to come across as really gruff because they're you know a tough defense attorney? Um, and so we found that people that are using videos in, in a responsible way and kind of putting that throughout their website, that they tend to get more form submissions versus ones where it's just you know that huge block of text, right? Because if you think about yourself as a user, if you don't know any of these lawyers, everyone's going to say they're the best lawyer, they went to the best law school. And so then it becomes more intangibles that help you make that decision. And you get those intangibles through watching a video. So big opportunity there. It's one of our stronger products that we, we sell. You're selling that as like a sub product for lawyers? Yep, it's just a, it's an add-on. Input video into their site. Yeah, it's a really expensive product. It's like ten thousand dollars for three videos. So it's kind of that old guard mindset. In my head, I'm like, well, these guys can just buy a camera and film it themselves. But you know, again, this is where the opportunity lies um, to us. Kind of in this space, this stuff is super easy. It's basic. It's just making a video. But to a lawyer or any lay person who's not within marketing, they're not within the internet technology, like. They know law stuff, right? We don't know that. Um, we know marketing, and so we can charge him ten grand because what's his alternative? You know, he bills at a thousand dollars an hour. He's not going to spend a month trying to figure out how to make a video. He's just going to give someone ten grand, be like do it in a month, and then to kind of normal people, it's like, whew. Um, but yeah, lots of opportunity in video. Uh, it's really daunting to people. Um, you know, writing, most people are comfortable with it. They teach it in school. The video, like, most people just don't. They're scared, almost. So, great opportunity for all you guys. Question online. Do you use any cheap creation tools like Animoto or Biddable? Um, I don't personally. Um, I Oh, it's with the Stout. Uh, email address is you can get the Adobe Cloud. It's like 20 bucks a month. Um, and that gives you After Effects and Adobe Premiere. So I just use that because 20 bucks a month, which is pretty inexpensive. But people make awesome, successful, viral content using just iMovie, right? The normal content that just, or programs that just come you know, with a Mac. Um, I think it's less about what editing tool you use and really about like, what's the content, who are the people, does it sound good? Is it engaging? Um, because you know, what tool you use just to slice up the different parts and put it together, almost irrelevant. Unless you make like a movie. You know. But for vlogs or something, you just put on you know, a small webcam, record, it's in. Yeah, my, mine is, I use Camtasia, but it's with a goal of doing as little editing as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's like I've got to turn out six videos this week. It I don't have time it, to edit. It's less intimidating, too. Yeah. I mean, those tools are super easy. Um, After Effects and Premiere can start getting their deep, deep rabbit holes you can yeah. go down. Yeah. And so um, even on your cell phone, right, just using iMovie on like an iPhone, super easy. And you can slice something, upload it, and do it in a couple minutes. What are some other resources? Whew. <laughs> Tons of resources. Um, I think for online, oh man, uh, okay. Uh, probably for production, I would look at more kind of traditional things. So understanding how to use a camera, like just buy a book, you know about that. Um, understanding lighting, um, you know, look at books or videos. Um, I watch a lot of just DIY YouTube videos there. Um, I'll also. Uh, look at different conventions. So that company, Narrative, N-A-R-I-T-I-V, um, posts a lot of really good stuff. Uh, HubSpot is a really, really good resource for all internet marketing stuff, and their video section is really helpful and really useful and sophisticated. Um, yeah, I would say probably HubSpot is the most accessible. Um, that does a good job of integrating video with all your other marketing channels. But then if there is a specific video question you have, I just Google it. So just to address that, I just brought up, and I'll share this for those of you that are online. Um, I brought up my YouTube channel, and 
when you go to YouTube, one of the things that they have over here is channel tips, filming on your phone, improving content ID. Uh, so they'll have little tips over there that address that because they want you to be successful because the more successful you are, the more successful they are. So, and I noticed this started showing up very recently. It's like, you know, here's a tip or this is what's wrong with this video. You want us to fix it. You know, this video is shaky. The first time I saw one uh, today was, we can fix the lighting in your video. Do you want us to do it for you? And you just click yes or let me see and it'll show you side by side. And then they'll just go through and mathematically fix it. It's like, okay, there you go. So they're doing everything in their power to make it as easy as possible for you to be successful because that's how they make money. That's exactly right. And we'll just see more and more of that, right? If Facebook really thinks that within the next five years it's going to be all video, we're going to make it as easy as possible for anyone to upload any type of content, like, like they do with photos now, right? You just like click your photo and then hit upload and then it's in the cloud. It's on. Um, we're going to see, we're already seeing that with video, but I think more and more like granular optimizations like the lighting or the shakiness, um, you know, seeing them continue to fix that stuff for us. That's where the money is. That's where the money is. That's what they're going to help you do. How, what's like the best way to do a cross-media video campaign? It's like, should we do you know, one way vertical, one way horizontal? Or? Um, depends on what camera you use. So even with GoPros now, you can like get 4K GoPros. Um, 300 bucks, 400 bucks, um, and if you're shooting in 4K video, um, in post-production, you can just cut out certain sections or just add it. Um, I think you can do that in iMovie. It's optimized for a few different um, uh, screens, and definitely in After Effects and in uh, Adobe Premiere, you can do that stuff, which I, I think they have at the, the office here. Um, You taking notes, Josh? I, I use those right. <laughs> do you do any like YouTube or anything for yourself, like personally on the side, or do you not like? Um, no, I would say not not professionally. I do it for fun. Um, so I've been really bullish on uh, video this year, and so right now I'm learning. After Effects, um, and that's been really helpful. But again, it's rabbit hole. I would say it probably has been half a year, so pretty pretty strong at it. But I can always improve. Um, yeah, kind of compete wise, I probably won't do anything professionally with it. But I do think that as people read less and less, it's just going to be how people communicate. And so even just as a side skill, regardless of what your kind of major or focus is. Like, I don't do anything strictly video um, at my job. I kind of, you know, help optimize and oversee that video team. Um, just having that skill in the back of your pocket is awesome, right? To know how to optimize it across all this different stuff. Because depending on what marketing job you get, they're going to ask you to do SEO, they're going to ask you to do PPC, they're going to ask you to do video and social. And so at least having a rudimentary understanding of these channels, how they work, how to actually create a video, um, I think is really important and will just be beneficial. Even if you think about getting a job, right? It's like you can make a personal, and this is one thing that I'm going to be working on over this next year, is um, I already have a website that has kind of my resume. Um, and so if people are searching for me, they can go there and kind of see you know, my work experience and other. Um, I want to start adding more videos there. Uh, because if you think about it, if one person is sending a piece of paper and then someone else is like, Oh, here's a video of this guy presenting, and you know, here's a video of him, you know, talking through SEO or whatever it is. It's going to be a more compelling message to get, you know, that position versus everyone else who just has, you know, a you know, piece of paper printed on Microsoft Word. Are you in a position where you actually hire people? Yep. And are you uh, starting to see that? No, no, no. Uh, not not in the, not really in the search area for the uh, for some video folks they have reels um, so we'll see that uh, some of our graphic designers are moving into doing more motion graphics so we're seeing more applications there on the SEO side I haven't seen one um, but that's because 
you know, SEOs are a little bit more, a little bit more of an introverted, uh, kind of behind the scenes, right? Optimizing the website, not necessarily the face of the website. So you see a little bit less comfort there. Um, I was recently talking to a friend at, oh, what kind of was it? UHG, I think, United Health Group. Um, pretty big provider. It's like Fortune 7 company based in uh, <coughs> Minneapolis or kind of like a little west of there. And their application process now is um, to video. It's uh, five questions that you get. So you don't even talk to an actual human for the first round. The first round, uh, and he, he walked me through the tool. It's pretty neat. What happens is the question pops up. You have 30 seconds and then a countdown timer. Um, to kind of think through your answer, and then it turns on instantly. So then you have three minutes, and it's counting down, and you have to answer that question. You do that five times, so the whole process takes about 20 minutes. Um, but uh, it's a better way for the recruiters to get an understanding <clears throat> who you are, um, you know, kind of like your poise, confidence, how are you able to kind of think up on your feet, how comfortable are you with new technology. And so for a lot of mar marketing jobs, it's going to be a really strong indicator. If you're used to and comfortable in front of the camera talking, understanding lighting and those things, you're going to look better than someone who's you know, maybe never used their webcam before and is now awkwardly trying to you know, talk to a camera for the first time. Um, and if that's what's going to help you, you know, make it through that first filter, you know, it's always going to be to your benefit. Um, that's why it's really important um, you know, with this channel or anything else is as new things come out, just play with it to get a better understanding. Some things might fizzle out. Some things will become very, very real and a really big part of your, your job or your profession. Um, but it's better to kind of understand them all rather than just kind of hoping and praying um, you know, that the job or position or, or client that you have you know, only wants those specific skill sets that you have at the moment. All right. OK. Thank you very much, John. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Aaron. Yeah, I never get applause. Thank you guys for uh, coming out, Apple Valley, Jim. Um, you know, let's let's make this a regular thing. You know, uh, if you got students who are interested in both learning about us, guys, thanks for coming out. If you're at all interested in Stout or in our program, um, give me a call. Give me an email. Yep. You guys actually have like a speaker debate group. Uh, I, we have courses. I don't think we have a speech or debate program. No, we're um, more focused on a polytechnic approach, and that would be more of a liberal arts um, type of school. On the other hand, you can utilize those skills quite a bit. Yeah, actually, debate uh, forensics is a huge skill. The ability to, just like you're saying, that ability to think on your feet, speak, uh, great tool. We require everyone to take those courses, but we don't have majors in it. Man, had me on the spot there for a second, but no, we, we don't have a major in speech or debate. All right. Uh, if there's still pizza out there, um, take it, eat it, bring it home if there's enough to bring home. Somebody, anybody, everybody, uh, take it, eat it. We'll see you guys. Uh, papers are due next Tuesday, not later than Tuesday. If they're in by Sunday, no bonus points, but excellent. Um, so, you know, those of you guys that are planning on going deer hunting, that means that they're due Friday. <laughs> so, because I know you're not going to work on it Saturday or Sunday, and if you turn it in after Tuesday, you're going to sink. So, Is it midnight Tuesday or 6 p.m.? Uh, you know, actually, I think I set the time of class uh, as, yeah. as the due time. I don't remember, but... I mean, <laughs> midnight's fine. I just have to get it to the Thompson Reuters people on Wednesday morning because uh, they will be reading these. Very curious to see how well you've watched their videos and learned the information that they've been sharing with you. All right, guys, I'm going to stop the video. Thank you guys that are online. And recording.